Let's go. This is Drew with Show's Process. I'm uh, getting ready to leave for work, and I've got a little bit of time here, so I thought I would uh, see if I could get through chapter 6.12 of Tony Robbins' Money Master the Game. This is a fairly short chapter, and this is the end of 6, so this will take us to section 7. And uh, as I've said many times, seven is basically uh, almost just an outro. So let's do this, man. I'm super stoked. Like, I I'm like, I can't believe this is like, this is it. Chapter 6.12, Sir John Templeton, the greatest investor of the 20th century. Founder, uh, it says question mark at the end, so I should have said the greatest investor of the 20th century. <laughs> Founder of Templeton Mutual Funds, philanthropist, creator of the One Million Templeton Prize. He kind of looks like Bob Barker. I saw somebody earlier today, and I was like, they look like Bob Barker, and this guy kind of looks like Bob Barker. Sir John Templeton wasn't just one of the greatest money masters of all time. He was one of the greatest human beings who ever lived. And I had the honor of counting him as one of my mentors. His motto, how little we know, how eager to learn, guided his long and dazzling life as an investment pioneer, icon, iconoclast, spiritual seeker, and philanthropist. Sir John was known for his ability to look at the most difficult situations in the world and find a way to take advantage of them for the greater good. John Templeton was not always known as Sir John, he came from humble beginnings in a small town in Tennessee where he reared to value thrift, where he was reared to value thrift, self-sufficiency, self I'm sorry, Tony, self-sufficiency and personal discipline. He worked his way through Yale and Oxford and got his first job on Wall Street in 1937. In the depths of the Great Depression, he was the original contrarian who believed in buying shares at the point of maximum pessimism pessimism. When everyone else thought the world was going to end, John thought it was the right time to invest. When everyone else thought, oh my god, these are the greatest times in history, that was when it was time to sell. He put his first theory, he put his theory to the test in the fall of 1939 with the depression still raging and Hitler's troops rolling into Poland at the start of World War II. John Templeton decided to take all the money he had saved and borrow, borrow some additional money as well and buy $100 worth of every stock valued at $100 or less in the New York Stock Exchange. That portfolio became the basis of a vast personal fortune and asset management empire. He also became a pioneer in international investing. While the rest of the Americans refused to look beyond U.S. borders, John was scouring the world for opportunities and as his fortune grew so did his commitment to giving back in 1972 he established the world's greatest annual reward given to an individual bigger than the nobel prize honoring spiritual achievements mother Teresa was the first recipient of the templeton prize his foundation also funded research in science and technology and in 1987, Queen Elizabeth knighted him for his enormous contributions to humanity. Sir John continued to speak and write and inspire millions with his humble message of integrity, entrepreneurship, and faith right up to the time of his death in 2008 at the age of 95. Incidentally, he had accurately predicted, ac accurately, accurately predicted the collapse of the housing bubble that year. The following is an excerpt from an interview I conducted with him just months before his passing. His kindness shines through in every answer as he shares his philosophy that, that the same qualities that make you, great, make you a great investor can also make you a great human being. TR Sir John, most people seem to be either money-oriented or spiritually oriented. They have to be one or the other, but you seem to have found a way to integrate these two in a truly natural and real way in your life. Can people integrate both in their lives? JT, definitely. There is no disparity. 
Would you want to deal with a businessman who, could not, who you could not trust? No. If a man has a reputation for not being trustworthy, people will run away from him. His, businesses will, his business will fail. But if another man has high ethical principles, high spiritual principles, he will try to give his customers and his employees more than they expect. If so, he will be popular. He will have more customers. He will make more profit. He will do more good in the world, and thereby he will prosper himself and have more friends and be more respected. So always start out to give more than is expected from you, to treat the other person more than fairly, and that is the secret of success. Never try to take advantage of anyone or hold anyone back in their own progress. The more you help others, the more prosperous you will be personally. TR what was your first investment? What drew you to it? And how did you turn how did it turn out? JT I was just getting started when it was in the beginning of Second World War in September nineteen thirty nine. We had just finished the world's greatest depression and there were many bankrupt companies, but a war causes demand for almost every product. So during a war almost every company will prosper again. So I gave a stockbroker an order to buy $100 worth of every stock on both exchanges selling for a dollar or less and there were 104 of them. And out of those I made a profit on 100 and lost money on only 4. So three years later when my wife and I had an opportunity to take over this small practice of retiring investment counselor we had the savings to do that. We began with no clients in Radio City in New York and worked there for 25 years, continuing to save 50 cents out of every dollar so that we could build our assets for our retirement and for our charity. TR, wow, and you got quite a big return saving 50 cents out of every dollar, Sir John. Most people today would say that's impossible. I can't save 50% of my money and invest it, but that's how you built from nothing, and you did this during the Depression. I've also read that if someone invested $100,000 with you in 1940, never put another dime in, and forgot all about the money, by 1999, they would have been worth $55 million. Is that accurate number? JT, yes, provided they reinvested their distributions. TR, let me ask you about investing philosophy. In the past, you said to me, not only do you buy at maximum pessimism, but you want to sell at the peak of optimism. Is that correct? JT, that's correct. There's a good saying there, Tony. Bull markets start on the time of pessimism. They rise in the time of skepticism. They mature, they mature on the time of optimism, and they end on the time of euphoria. It always happens in every bull market, and it helps you determine where you are. If you just talk with enough investors to find their psychology, you can tell whether the market is still safe at a low level or high and dangerous level. TR, what do you think is the single biggest mistake investments make, investors make? JT, the great majority of people do not build up wealth because they do not practice the self-discipline of saving some of their income every month. But beyond that, once they've saved that money, then you have to invest it wisely in good bargains, and it's not easy. It's very rare for any one person, particularly any one person working in just their spare time, to select the right investments, any more than you would want to own your own medical doctor or your own lawyer. It's not wise to try to own your own business manager, to be your own business manager. It's better to find the best professionals, the wisest security analysts to help you. TR, when I was talking to some of the associates down in the Bahamas, I was asking them, what does he invest in? And he said, anything. He'll buy a tree if he thinks it can be a good deal on it. Then I said, how long will he hang on to it? And they said, forever, basically until it's worth more. Sir John, how long do you hang on to an investment before you know when to let go? How do you know if you've made a mistake? How do you know when it's time to actually liquidate? JT, that is one of the most important questions. Most people will say, I know when to buy, but I don't know when to sell. But over these 54 years that I've been helping investors, I think I have the answer. And that is, you sell an asset only when you think you have found a different asset that's a 50% better bargain. You search all the time for a bargain, and then you look at what you now own. 
if there's something in the present list that is 50% less good bargain than the one you found, you sell the one, the old one, and you buy the new one. But even then, you're not right all the time. TR, Sir John, why should Americans feel good about investing outside their own country? JT, think about this. If your job is to find the best opportunities, surely we will find more opportunities if we do not limit ourselves to just one nation. Likewise, perhaps we will find better opportunities if we're able to look everywhere rather than in just one nation. But most important is that it does reduce the risk because every nation has bear markets, usually twice every 12 years. There's a severe bear market in a majority nation, but Sometime they do not God occur at the same the time. Sometimes God blesses the house with a person named Dominic Jarvis Monster, and when he walks through the motherfucking house, you pay yeah, all the respects to his What's the language? I'm almost done with this chapter. I love you. Happy birthday, Obey Pain. I told Jose, you gotta give me the fuck home. I need to spend time with my motherfucking family. Give me one second to finish. I'm literally almost done with this. Mm. We have always advised our investors. <laughs> Are you jealous? I know you're jealous. Like, just say it. You see them cream laces? Damn, dude. We have always advised our investors to be diversified. Right Not only diversified into more than one corporation and diversified into more than one industry, but also diversified in more than one nation in order that they will get greater safety and greater potential profit. Hey, do you want to cut the cheesecake and do that real quick? Yeah, for sure. Okay, all right. As soon as I'm done with this, we will. AJ's in the shower. JT, thank you. I do not regard myself... Oh, J TR, sorry. What do you think that has separated you from all the other investors out there? What's made you one of the greatest investors of all time? JT, thank you. I do not regard myself as that. We've not always been right. No one is. But we have tried to be a little bit better than the other competitors and give more than is expected from us and always try to improve our methods. To us, new methods in order to stay ahead of the competition. If there is any secret in it, it's to do this. Do not try to be a go-getter. Try to be a go-giver. TR, Sir John, there's so much fear out there today on so many levels of society. How do we deal with fear? JT, to overcome fear, the best thing is to be overwhelmingly grateful. If you woke up each morning and think of five things of which you're overwhelmingly grateful, you're not likely to be fearful. You're likely to radiate your optimism, your gratitude of gratitude, your attitude of gratitude. You're likely to do things in a better way, draw more people to you. So I would think an attitude of gratitude will prevent a life of fear. TR, I would love to hear your own perception. Who is Sir John Templeton? What is your life really about? In the end, how do you want to be remembered? JT, I am a student, always trying to learn. I am a sinner, all of us are. I have tried to be better every day, and particularly I try to keep asking myself, what are the purposes of God? Why did God create the universe? What does God expect from his children? And the closest you can come in just a few words is, he expects us to grow spiritually. He gives us trials and tribulations just like ha just like you have examinations in school because it will help you to grow in, into a greater soul than you have otherwise. So life is a challenge. Life is an adventure. It's a marvelous, exciting adventure. All of us should do our very best we can. All of us should do the very best we can as long as the Lord allows us to be on this planet. I felt like I really rushed through this one because I was a bit excited and I knew that my son was coming home and um, I want to cut his cake open and do that whole thing uh, before before I leave for work but um, but I gotta I gotta tell you um, That was that was pretty uh, that was dope. I hope you appreciated. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of got cut off there, but I hope you appreciated the words from from this man um, because I really uh, I like that message, um, and if you know me, you should already know what I'm doing here. Wow. 
November 29th, 1912, Sagittarius. It's... Pretty incredible. I've been talking about Sagittarius men quite a bit lately, and uh, they are uh, some individuals with really big hearts. I always, I used to label Sagittarius men, specifically men, uh, as the savage of the zodiac, but they really do have big hearts, and um, and so it doesn't surprise me that, that someone. Uh, with that type of spirit uh, would be a Sagittarius obviously I don't know his uh, entire breakdown uh, for his birth chart but uh, but I, I, I appreciate that you know and I I genuinely believe as he said uh, you can't be in both places at the same time you cannot be in a state of fear and gratitude in the same moment if you're grateful for everything you have you can't be afraid it's just uh, it's almost impossible. I guess maybe there's a scenario in which that could happen, but I haven't met one yet. And I know when I'm feeling extremely grateful, I'm not worried about anything. I'm so excited. <laughs> like, I'm so stupid excited. Chapter 7.1. And I mean, this is like... Like, this is it. Like, this is the end. You know? Um, so... I don't know, man. I might just get crazy with it and and uh, on my next day off, just read like all that and and just blow it out and and you know, thanks, Tony. I've appreciated this book a lot more than maybe I thought I was going to. I can't wait to completely finish this and see what happens. Um, even if it's just learning to invest when everyone else is scared to invest. Because so far, that's one of the biggest things I've taken from this book is the three main things I've taken from this book, I would say to this point anyways, and I'll do like a full video, you know, uh, once I'm done to kind of just go over everything. But I would say number one is finding your purpose. It's not about retirement. It's not about the money. It's about finding what makes you happy. Two, giving back. And three, gratitude. There, there are many other things that I've taken from this book, but those three things are, I would say for sure are, are tops on the list. So I hope everybody out there uh, has a great evening, morning, day, whatever, whenever you listen to this. I super appreciate the ones that have been listening, and I'm still a bit flabbergasted at the fact that so many people have started watching these videos. I'm really kind of taken back. It's been pretty awesome. So until next time, I'm going to keep grinding. I'm going to keep moving forward. I will always trust the process. I'm going to go chill with my boy, celebrate. Y'all have a good one. I'm out.